this episode, I'm joined once again by Jay Garfield to discuss his book, Losing Ourselves, Learning to Live Without a Self. I'd like to say a big thank you to my paying patrons and subscribers for making all of this work possible. And if you would like to support the podcast and keep it running, please find links in the description below. Otherwise, please enjoy. So, Jay Garfield, thanks once again for joining me on Hermetics Podcast. It's a real pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. We are going to be discussing your book, Losing Ourselves, Learning to Live Without a Self, uh, which I believe has uh, got a fair amount of acclaim, if I'm right in thinking that. I mean, it seems to be a fairly well-known book in quite a short amount of time. Am I right in thinking that? Well, some people have liked it. I think others may not have, but, you know, it's uh, it's getting a little bit of attention, yeah. Mm-hmm. So this book, as uh, people might gather from the title is about the notion of a self and what we say when we speak of having a self and it's split into two parts the first part is uh the you could say philosophy behind disproving this notion of self and then bringing in the notion of person or i guess a person as a not necessarily a counter but what we're really talking about when we talk about self and then the second part which is actually shorter but i thought was just my own appreciation was like the more important part because this notion of not having a self is found in in, in many thinkers. But what you you do, which is very interesting, is saying, okay, we now have this ironically foundation. What can we do with that? You know, what does that actually c- can we do in terms of for you the central Buddhist question, which is suffering? You know, ethically, what can we do with the self? So. I guess uh, I will ask just 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 before we dive into self and person and these things, what's the genesis of the book? How come you uh, came to write it? Well, it's actually a curious genesis. Um, I was actually asked to write this book by uh, my editor at Princeton University Press, and that's because my friend and colleague um, had uh, written a book called Uh, Why I Am Not a Buddhist, that's Evan Thompson, published on Yale University Press about a year before mine or a year and a half before mine. And my editor at Princeton University Press um, called me and said, we'd kind of like you to write a reply. And I said, well, I'm not going to write a book called Why I Am a Buddhist, because that doesn't make much sense. Um, And he said, no, 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 we'd like you to think of some aspect of Evan's book with which you take issue and address that. And one of the chapters of Evan Thompson's book is called No Self, Not So Fast, where he defends the notion of a self against Buddhist critiques. And I thought, I can reply to that. Um, And so that's why I wrote it. And then, of course, it turned out to be, I thought it was going to be easy because, hey, I've thought about self and no self for a long time in my long engagement with the philosophy of David Hume and um, with Buddhist philosophy. And I teach this stuff all the time. So I thought this should be really easy. Um, Only I discovered that it was really hard. (laughs) It's the hardest book I've ever written because the the mandate was to write a book that is accessible to and of interest to the general public, not professional philosophers. And that turns out to be hard because the book has to be short enough that it's worth people buying it. It's got to be clear enough, um, even though it's short. Um, and it's got to do that without a whole lot of professional jargon and technical terms and references to the literature, because you simply can't presuppose that your readers are going to be interested in that. And it turns out that satisfying those three needs while knowing that your colleagues are looking over your shoulder, making sure you don't dumb it down, is really hard. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, that's that's the genesis of the book, an attempt to bring these ideas to a general public, much as Evan brings his ideas to a general public. I mean, yeah, when I think about that now, you the, the, there's two huge things you're trying to do in that accessible manner. One is dispel one of the most sort of, well, pro- possibly, I guess you might say, the most unspokenly accepted notion that we have we say it probably daily multiple times the mm-hmm. self so dispel that and then at the same time use that to uh construct an ethics around the problem of life which is suffering and make that accessible within you know less than 300 pages i think you succeeded so i you know i will hardly recommend this book uh to everyone 
But I want to begin with just an open question regarding possibly my favorite part of the book. And I guess this is probably the struggle for you in the accessibility notion, which is when you begin by trying to dispel the notion of the self, you're immediately in the paradox that you are seeking to you have to try to find the thing which isn't a thing. So I just I want to throw that question at you because I found it almost humorous when you're writing about it in the book because you're I don't mean you're stuck, but in the book it's like, what do I you know, what do I do with this? And we say it all the time, right? Myself, me, mm-hmm. I, yeah, I, you know, myself, I love that. But there's this problem, all right, well, let's dig down. So I'll ask you, what is itself? Yeah, that's that's a really good question. And, and you did pinpoint one of the real challenges of writing a book like this. If you want to deny that something exists, you first have to figure out what it is you're denying exists and uh, to, de- to describe it in clear enough terms that people understand what doesn't exist um, and uh, then that you can also show that it doesn't. Um, I mean, after all, if you're trying to show that Santa Claus doesn't exist, um, you've got to be really clear about who it is you mean. It's not the fat guy down at the mall in the weeks before Christmas. Mm. He certainly exists. <laughs> um, what you're talking about, if you say that Santa Claus doesn't exist, is there's no guy who's got a fleet of rain, flying reindeer mm. who manages to get to every house where there are good children on Christmas Eve, zip down the chimneys and deliver them presents. Nobody does. That. But mm. the first thing you have to do is say, what do we mean by Santa Claus? Mm. We don't mean the guy dressed up in the red suit down at the mall. What we mean is the guy with the flying reindeer who comes down chimneys. So you've got to specify that clearly enough that when you say it doesn't exist, people know what you're talking about. And it's harder to do that with the self than it is with Santa Claus. But that's where, fortunately, we get a little bit of help from the Indian and Tibetan philosophical tradition, Buddhist tradition. And in particular, from a 15th century Tibetan philosopher named Tsongkhapa, who refers to this process as identifying the object of negation. And he makes it clear that when you want to say there isn't something, you must first be very, very precise about what that thing is that there isn't. (laughs) And he's riffing on a remark that Chandrakirti makes um, that I use, who is a seventh century Indian philosopher, whose um, analogy I use throughout the book. And that is Chandrakirti says, look, it's not going to do if you're worried that there's a snake in the wall of your house to convince yourself there's no elephant around and then just relax. You've really got to get rid of the snake, not get rid of the elephant. And very often in both sophisticated philosophical discussions And even in popular literature about the self, I think people are chasing elephants instead of snakes by not paying careful attention to what it is that we think we are when we think we have a self. Mm. So I did that by just using a kind of pair of thought experiments um, that I like to use to get people to focus on exactly what that illusion is. One is the thought experiment where I ask people to imagine having a different body, um, occupying somebody else's body, maybe for a few minutes, maybe for a longer time. If you can formulate that desire, um, or even if you can imagine having that desire, I mean, you might be totally happy with your own body and not have that desire, but if you can even imagine having that desire, then you recognize that you don't think of yourself as your body. Rather, you think of yourself as somebody who has a body, Um, but is different from it and might be the same self with a different body. Mm -hmm. Similarly, we can do the same thing with our minds, I think, to say, whose mind would you like to have? Maybe for a little while, maybe for a longer time. And again, if you can even imagine having that kind of desire, then you don't think of yourself as identical with your mind either. You think of yourself as something that has a mind. So when we try to identify the self that we're talking about, the self that I take as the target, the one that I think we instinctively identify with, is something standing behind our psychophysical states that is constant amidst all of their change, that is the subject of our experience, the agent of our actions, Mm 
and never an object, never something that we act on. And it's that kind of hidden ego behind everything else or a background um, sense of, of, of identity that I take to be the target. I think that's who we generally pre-reflectively think we are. And I think that that kind of thing is as mythical as Santa Claus. Mm. So in reality, would you say that we actually are the the mouse Santa Claus? Yeah, we're Which person. is a temporary connected to that exact object, those objects that are right before us in the mall. We're that one, which is going to be fleeting and gone next year. Exactly. We are a, a constantly changing, causally open sequence of psychophysical processes constituted in part by what's happening to us internally and physically, constituted in part by our relations to others and our place in society, constituted in part by our own self-conception and the stories we tell about us, about ourselves. So the analogy that I use throughout the book is to say that if we imagine going to the theater, um, we go there to see characters in a play, Mm. not focus on actors. We're like the characters, um, fictions that are created and constituted by a whole set of institutions and not reducible to the particular actor who's playing us at a moment. The fictions are real. And fictions are real. Mm. It's um, a point that I do make that I think is really fun because I love words, is that in English, the word fact and fiction are essentially the same word. Um, a fiction is something we make up. A fact, as in the word factory, um, is something that has been made or constituted. Um, and the words, of course, have diverged since about the 18th century. But um, before that, nobody would have thought twice about thinking that facts are fictional and fictions are facts. And when we create fictions, we create facts. Mm -hmm. So when Shakespeare wrote Hamlet, he created the fact that Hamlet is Danish and not French. Um, and if you take an exam in a literary class and you say, Hamlet, the Prince of France, you got it wrong. And it's no defense to say, hey, he's not the prince of anything. I can make up whatever I want. Once the character exists, even if he's fictional, there are facts about him that get preserved. As for instance, in Tom Stoppard's play, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead. The Hamlet that we've got is the Hamlet who Shakespeare created. We have to deal with the facts about that fictional character in order to make sense of that play. So what's intriguing then, I think, that where do you see this notion of the self, this, this, uh, the real Santa Claus, the, there is some real, whatever the self might be, still a very difficult thing to cotton on to, to be self-acknowledging of. Where does that historically arise from? Well, I think we have to look at it in two respects. One is the question, where does the kind of illusion, the instinctive illusion that we've got, derive from? Um, I'll give you an analogy in a moment. And secondly, where does theorization about it arise from? Um, because we've got kind of two things here. We've got an, a kind of atavistic illusion to which we all succumb that I think is an illusion to which we've evolved to succumb. Um, we also have philosophy being built on top of that to explain what that thing is. And we have to kind of um, consider both of those and respond to both of those. So analogy, an analogy that I use throughout the book is the Mueller liar illusion, the illusion that we can generate by taking two line parallel lines of equal length and put arrowheads on each line, on one of them arrowheads facing out, on one of them facing in. And when you do that, you discover that suddenly the line with arrowheads facing out looks much smaller than the one with arrowheads facing in. Mm -hmm. That's an optical illusion to which we are subject because of the way that our visual system evolved to use edges and vertices to estimate the size of things. Um, it's a an evolutionary um, adaptation that is very useful to us most of the time, but can lead to illusions if we're very clever and draw the right things on pieces of paper. Um, now, 
nobody has ever fortunately decided to erect the kind of metaphysics on top of this, then explaining how it is that drawing little arrowheads changes the length of lines. Um, because everybody recognizes that this is an illusion and there's no kind of underlying reality behind it. Um, on the other hand, with the self, um, the illusion is so powerful, I think, and so pervasive um, and so important in our lives that there's lots of philosophy erected on top of it to try to explain what this illusory thing is. And we have to respond to that as well as to the illusion itself. Where does the illusion itself come from? I don't know. And I don't think that anybody does. I have a hunch, but it's a hunch with absolutely no evidence behind it. So I want to emphasize that. <laughs> um, my hunch is that it's an evolutionary spandrel on our very useful capacities um, of proprioception and interoception. That is our ability to know the positions of our bodies in space, where we are relative to other things, and to attend to our internal sensations, um, which can give us a lot of clues about our health and well-being, right? Mm. And so we, we have evolved to be very good at, at figuring out where we are in space and where the parts of our body are. And that helps us with all kinds of things. Uh, hand-eye coordination, detection of predators, um, knowing where where and how to sit down when we come into a room and so forth, as well as to be um, acutely aware of inner sensations that can give us clues about whether we're sick, healthy, injured, or so forth. And I kind of think that just as the susceptibility to the Mueller-Lyer illusion is a spandrel on um, edge detection and, and kind of object recognition, that the sense of self is a spandrel on these capacities. But I've got no evidence for that whatsoever. It's just the only just so story I can tell. But on top of that, we get tons and reams and reams and reams of bad philosophy that then try to explain what this self is. Sometimes it's stuck outside of space and time as the thing that projects space and time. Sometimes um, it is thought of as a kind of narrative creation or a narrative that is nonetheless real. Sometimes it's thought of as this sort of background sense of for meness or awareness of my own subjectivity. Um, sometimes it's a substance. Sometimes it's an interior space. And the, the interesting thing is that philosophers in many, many traditions have proposed various ideas about this and debated them quite hotly. And in some traditions, again, philosophers have argued that, no, that's a mistake. There really is not a self. Um, but what I try to do in the book, of course, is both to dispel the illusion and to point out why it's an illusion, but also to try to respond to some of those philosophical um, attempts to give more substance than is necessary to that illusion. There's a, a couple of questions immediately arise from that. I mean, one, we discussed this last, uh, this, uh, the, this figure, one Emmanuel Kant, last time in our discussion on uh, hegemony, hegemony of Western philosophy, um, with regards to Kant often being seen as, you know, philosophy starts here, uh, that pro progressive illusion of philosophy once again, which I think actually ties into this notion. But this idea that you have, that once again, I, I'll also have to emphasize this, that there's no basis for this, but this notion of it possibly being a spandrel, would you then say that... Uh, Kant's critical project, beginning with a critique of pure reason, is almost a, a neurotic defense of that of that an idea. Because Kant himself, you know, has this bi biographically and philosophically has this hyperfixation on borders and border disputes. And you read the critique of pure reason, and every single step is like handled you know with cotton wool to make sure it's all packaged and then with your book you know we get through and you of course you know many philosophers now would say well Hume came before but in your book you, you at a certain point uh it's the unity of uh a perception this is where I think for you this if we're going to go with the spandrel line where it all falls down or, or, or a key place where it all falls down yeah I don't know that I would use the word neurotic I think I would say careful meticulous somewhat brilliant 
um, relent, relentless, um, but I don't want to do the psychodiagnosis. <laughs> um, I because um, I have an enormous admiration for Kant and the critical philosophy and and for the edifice of the critique of pure reason. Um, and it is a brilliant book, which requires you know a fair amount of thought, um, both to understand and to engage with critically. Um, I do think, though, that Kant's notion of a transcendental unity constituting the self um, is almost the reductio on the notion of the self as permanent subject. And so you're right. Well, a lot of people think of Kant as coming along to correct the deficiencies in Hume. And then Hume gets seen as this kind of whipping boy who gets, you know, kicked in the butt from Prussia um, for failing to see that there has to be a self, for failing to see that there has to be a necessary unity in our experience and so forth. I honestly think that Hume gets the better of the argument, um, that when Kant is forced to locate our fundamental existence outside of space and time um, to make sense of who we are, you have to scratch your head and ask, am I really something that exists outside of space and time? Or am I just one more spatio-temporal object, um, one more kind of animal like the other animals that roam this planet? And the moment you ask that question, I think you have to answer the latter. I'm a spatio-temporal thing. I can talk about where I am now. I can talk about what time we're, we're meeting today. Um, and I locate my existence in that way. And I can locate Kant's existence in space and time. He was in Prussia in the 18th century, right? Um, I can do that. Um, so that if I'm forced to, um, to remove the self from the spatio-temporal matrix, and to posit it as kind of the thing that constitutes that matrix in order to make sense of my own identity, I think something has gone very, very, very seriously wrong. Another way to put that um, is to um, look at the way that Kant is forced to posit really two things that, are, that, that might answer to the word self. There's an empirical self, um, and then there's a transcendental self, right? So there's the self that appears to me, and then the self to whom it appears. And I think, again, when we ask ourselves, how many are we? The answer that the instinctive answer is one, not two. So if Kant has got to get two of us in there, we kind of know he's kind of not just taking the, um, the myth, but kind of ramifying the myth in ways that sort of force it to stop making sense. Hume, on the other hand, I think saw clearly that what we are are constantly changing sequences of psychophysical processes and that we can make perfectly good sense of our psychology, of our experience, of our interaction with the world, of our um, ethical um, obligations um, in terms of persons conceived that way. Um, it just, it works a lot better. Kant has to exempt us from the causal nexus. And so we get this weird idea of transcendental freedom, which makes action simply incomprehensible. If nothing causes my actions, where the hell do they come from, right? That means my intentions don't even cause them. So we get this total self-alienation as a consequence of that project. Um, so anyway, yes, I, th I think that um, we get a much prettier, um, much more elegant explanation of our identity um, in the Humean or the Chandrakirtian picture than in the Kantian or the Vedanta picture. Sort of a tangential question then. Do you, with regard to uh, this sort of possible, once again, spandrel evolutionary bordering, you know, we need to locate ourselves, which maybe has transformed into a sort of we love to contain, you know, mm -hmm. we feel safe and stable with this container. That itself has de possibly developed into the notion of a linear contained philosophy, where would you say maybe that philosophy is nonlinear? You know, you, the two key figures in your book are, are Chandra Kirti and Hume, and then we could also look at the split between Parmenides and Heraclitus as, an, as another key split. Do you see that sort of once there's that 
I don't want to say a dualism, but it is a consistent dualism that seems to be happening. Do you think it's nonlinear that just these ideas arise because they arise? I can't exactly say why, but that spandrel itself has tried or has amalgamated that very notion of philosophy, which defends it. Progressive, yeah. progressive philosophy. Yeah. Um, I guess I see philosophy, if I were to look for a geometric metaphor, it wouldn't be a line, but it would be a spiral. Um, so that we end up kind of coming back to the same questions again and again. So on one dimension, that is, if you're looking down the spiral, we're just going around in circles. And the same questions that animated classical Indian philosophy, classical Chinese philosophy, classical Greek philosophy, um, a lot of philosophy in other areas of the world, um, continues to animate that philosophy. But each time we come to it, I think that we're able to kind of ask the questions at a higher level in a more sophisticated way because it can reflect on what people have done before. So you and I can talk about Hume and Kant and Chandrakirti and Udyotakara and all of these folks, and they couldn't because they were them. <laughs> um, they could talk about other people, but they couldn't talk about them. So we're able to ask the questions with maybe more sophistication, more depth, because of what they've done. Um, I think that philosophical questions that are worth asking are generally impossible to completely answer. Um, and that's what makes philosophy so much fun. Um, we don't ask the questions because we're pretty sure that we ourselves are going to provide the final answers. That would be kind of depressing, just as nobody um, picks up a, a brush and attacks a canvas thinking they're going to finally end art mm -hmm. by producing the perfect painting um, or composes the last song and it was just so good that nobody else will ever have to write music again. Um, I think of philosophy very much on the analogy of the arts, that it develops in dialogue with everything that happened before it, but it always anticipates a future. Mm. And the reason we can anticipate the future is because the questions we ask are just so difficult that we know that our answers can at best be provisional. Well, I, I was as you were talking, I was visualizing these these spirals. I'm going to ask you a very abstract geometrical question here. Uh-oh. <laughs> oh, I apologize. Is that spiral a cylinder or is it a cone? That's a very interesting question. And if uh, it's a cone, you know what I'm going to ask. Yeah, I do. Um, I'm, I'm going to venture a guess because I think now we're really into serious metaphilosophical <laughs> speculation. I think that it's a spiral in which everybody believes that they are actually functioning in a cone. <laughs> I like that. So that almost everybody thinks, gosh, we're converging on something. Mm -hmm. But that convergence, I think, is always elusive, and we always end up coming back around. Um, <laughs> a converge, uh, uh, a converging Ouroboros. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's, I mean, that's probably the best we, in, in a lifetime, in a temporary billiard ball human lifetime, maybe yeah. that's the best we can hope for. Okay. Okay. So let's um, let's sort of move from the self into the person. Yes. The person. Yeah. I mean, you know, once again, what's a what what's a person? And I guess what's the key productive difference? Because the second half of the book is regards the ethics, which is a you know, it's a, the second half is practical. It's saying, look, what yeah. does this alteration of how we understand the world actually? How does it actually affect our lives as we live them? So what is the key alteration between a person and a self with respect to how we experience, how we understand our experience as lived? Okay. I think that there are uh, several levels at which we could ask this question, and each one is interesting. Yeah. One level is what I'm just going to call a phenomenological or an epistemological level. That is... How does it help us to understand our own lived experience, to see ourselves in one way rather than another? Um, the second is how does it help us to think about practical rationality? 
um, about what we should be, how we can think productively about structuring our lives and structuring our values. And a third level is what does it do for interpersonal relationships, including ethical relationships? And it's really used to, useful to think of it in, in all of those levels. So let me start with the phenomenological level. Um, one of the things that I pointed out there where I was starting to think about expert performance um, and um, the way in which in expertise, our sense of self disappears and our sense of self tends to reappear and become strong in two principal kinds of contexts, I think. One is an affective context. Um, often when we're either uh, feeling offended or angry um, or when we're feeling really proud. Um, and each of those we should recognize are pathological contexts um, in fundamental ways. The pathology of anger um, is a pathology that emerges when I think that I, myself, has somehow been offended. Mm. And when I attribute that to another agent who I think has simply done that without any cause, freely, out of without uh, just coming out of who they are. Mm. So I posit a self in here to be offended. I posit a self out there to do the offending. Mm. And then I get angry. And it's worth recognizing, I mean, A, that, as, as we've said, that's kind of um, illusory, but B, that anger is not a really great um, a, a affective state um, in which to be. And that's for several reasons. One is it feels pretty bad, um, even if at the moment it might feel okay. I don't think anybody's ever said, what a great day. I got really angry and furious. And I'm always at my best when I'm furious. I do the smartest things and really help cement my relationship with other people when I completely lose it. So this was a great day because I was in rage all day. Nobody says that, right? Mm. Um, anger is something that leads us to have to apologize, that leads us to feel ashamed of what we've done and can be very destructive um, of interpersonal relations and of our own psychology. And anger is tightly connected to this perception of self. Maybe less obvious, pride is also, um, in that sense, pathological. Because when I'm proud of something that I've done or accomplished or something like that, um, I've somehow attributed that accomplishment to something I did all by myself, right? That something that I simply did. But we forget in cultivating that attitude of pride, that an attitude of gratitude is almost always um, a more appropriate attitude. So if you won the race, uh, remember it was your parents who bought you your first pair of running shoes, and it was your coach who helped you do all that training, and somebody built that track on which you did the training. Um, and so yes, you did stuff, but the first thing to recognize is that the stuff you did was only made possible by what a lot of other people did. And so once again, it's gratitude that is a more appropriate attitude than pride. Now, and patience, a more appropriate attitude than anger. Mm -hmm. When we replace anger with patience, or when we replace pride with gratitude, what we've done is recognized that everything that we do is causally enabled by what thousands, millions of, of other people have done and recognize that we don't exist in isolation, but as members of a large interdependent uh, social world. That's a more accurate reflection of who we are, and it's a healthier reflection of who we are. So that phenomenologically, if we understand ourselves um, as, as persons, we're more open to seeing that kind, the reality of our causal interdependence with others. Moreover, when we one of the things that the psychology of expert performance, whether it's in sport or surgery or music or whatever it tells us, is that that sense of self um, comes up 
when we're learning a new skill and kind of attending to what our body is doing or to what we're doing cognitively, um, but that it's it disappears when we become experts. Mm -hmm. Expert surgeons aren't thinking ideologically. It's about themselves when they're operating. A batsman um, facing a bowler in cricket is not thinking about himself or herself. The batsman is thinking about the ball <laughs> um, and thinking about where they're going to place the ball. Um, if you start thinking about yourself, you start getting the yips and your performance degrades. Mm -hmm. This is something any sports psychologist will tell you, right? So when people are having trouble in performance, very often what good sports psychologists do is try to get them to stop thinking about themselves and to be thinking more about the task. Um, so again, we get better flow, better expertise when we drop that self. Now, if you think about how much of our time we spend not at the crease in cricket, not in an operating room, at least for most of us, but rather talking to our friends, engaging with our partners, working with colleagues, um, reading a book, um, <laughs> hanging out at the pub, doing whatever. Um, to the extent that we keep, cannot constantly thematize a self in that, we're going to get in the way of being expert human beings. And to the extent that we drop that sense of self, which for most of us, frankly, is most of the time, mm -hmm. we can behave more spontaneously, more freely, and um, as better aspects, be better representatives of who we are. So phenomenologically, um, shedding the self and recognizing our interdependence and stopping focusing on that mythical inner thing makes us better at whatever we're doing. Um, that's that's kind of the first thing. The, the second is, as I've been hinting now, it helps our interpersonal relations. Mm -hmm. um, if you've ever talked to somebody who's totally self-fixated and constantly thinking about how he or she is prevent, presenting themselves, um, you recognize that you're dealing with somebody who is basically a pain in the ass um, and who is not only making your life miserable, but making their own life miserable because they simply can't get out of that to understand that they are, like you, a person interacting with others. Mm. Uh, when we can forget the self, we actually become better at our interpersonal relations. It's also important ethically mm. because it's not just attitudes like pride and anger that come up when we start thinking of ourselves as selves. It's also attitudes of um, moral blame and moral credit and desires to punish and so forth. Um, and the kind of myth that the only, um, the only actions for which we're responsible are those that are done in kind of absolute freedom, which of which there are none, right? Mm -hmm. So there's this danger that if you think that freedom Second, is a necessary condition of moral responsibility. Once you take seriously the fact that you are a causally conditioned biological organism in a complicated social world, you start thinking, gee, I'm not responsible for anything. And then you become a kind of moral monster. Or if you think that others are deeply responsible for things and deserve to be punished for them or rewarded for them because they acted freely, um, then you end up with this kind of distorted way of dealing with people, which is um, all focused on reward and punishment instead of a forward-looking um, desire to help people become simply better at who they are and to help yourself become better at who you are. So I think that we get a clearer sense of who we are, a better way of interacting with our fellows, and a clearer sense of our ethical life when we understand ourselves as persons rather than ourselves. So with regard to the, the, the sport, the sports expert analogy that you gave there, I mean, I think of something like perhaps learning to drive, right? It's very, yeah. when you originally learn to drive, it's a very explicitly conscious experience where you are very selved because I am now changing the gears. I am now mm -hmm. pushing down the clutch and keeping my eye on the roundabout. And then six months, 12 months down the line, you're sliding onto a roundabout and you basically aren't. So once you finally 
get in the car and you've learned, you've fully learned to drive, and that self has dissipated, what are you? A relational, a relational yeah. being? Then you're a person behaving spontaneously, and you're a hell of a better driver than you were when you had to focus on all that self stuff. And to expand that metaphor into social interactions to then, if during driving, if I was to suddenly become solved again and go, I need to change into this gear, mm -hmm. I'm going to cause, I'm, everything's going to go wrong because I'm over, yeah. I'm overthinking and it's all about me again. So with regards to social inter interrelations, you see that as much the same thing. Like as soon as you, as soon yeah. as you go, actually, I want to just put myself in here. It all goes haywire. And that's kind of the basis of Woody Allen movies, right? Um where you, you suddenly become so self-conscious that you end up tripping over yourself um, at, at every turn and you make a fool of yourself. Is the problem that, I mean, you said about the people who are extremely selfish, the people we would say are pain in the ass, is the inherent problem, the, you know, the, the, their inherent problem is because with respect to what we've said about the self right at the beginning, they're not really reaching to anything. There's not, that's right. That's, you know, so... What is it that they are bringing into the conversation? Just, just illusions, just, just things they mask. Yeah, that's right. And you know, again, let's look at it in two ways. One is just the social, um, the social relations. But let's start with an analogy. I mean, mm -hmm. think about playing a team sport. Mm -hmm. um, if you're if you're playing football, and the only thing you can do is desire to possess the ball and 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 and, and score. You're going to be the worst football player possible, right? Football can only be played as a team sport. Um, similarly, human social interactions are a team sport. Um, we are the the hypersocial great ape, and our hypersociality means that we've kind of evolved to be with others, to talk with others, to learn from others. Um, and the moment we kind of isolate ourselves and see ourselves as the subject and everybody else as the object, and then have that inner focus instead of a kind of expert spontaneity in, in interaction. We become like that, you know, ball hog on the, on the football field who destroys everything. Are there any benefits to the self? I don't think so. Um, I think that as I... I think it's, it really is an unfortunate illusion. Um, there are probably benefits to whatever it, it's sort of a spandrel on, right? Interception, proprioception, whatever else. But I think that it, the fact that it's natural doesn't make it good. And I think that's something we have to remember. A lot, I, I often talk to people say, but, but it has to be real or it has to be beneficial. Otherwise it wouldn't be so natural. But there's all kinds of things that are natural, but aren't good right mm. um and i think that that this is one of them the self is only a benefit in the world that it's created the illusory world it's created i think yeah. if, you know i don't know if you've seen the film wall street you know the, the classic greed is good like, mm. for him that's completely yeah. a beneficial self but that's only within that world yeah and i think that's kind of that attitude is a kind of consequence of the self-illusion that shows how bad it is. That is, if you've got the illusion of the self, then you have to think that there's something very different about you than everybody else. Namely, you're the subject and agent or the kind of psychological or agential center of the universe, and everybody else is an object. And we get that enshrined in decision theory and microeconomic theory when we end up with this crazy definition of rationality as the disinterested pursuit of our own narrow self-interest. Mm. Um, and if you think that that's rational, you're out of your mind, right? Um, because it, it, it elides the fact that all of our success and most of our happiness relies on the success of others and the happiness of others. I mean, imagine, for instance, um, going to a relationship counselor because you're having trouble with your partner. And the relationship counselor says, look, here's what you got to do. Each of you has to simply ignore what the other wants and just pursue your individual narrow self-interest because that's rational. And rational beings do really well together. I guarantee you, you're on your way to divorce. And they're on their way to malpractice. 
Um, we know that the only rational way to lead our lives is to make sure that the social networks and the communities in which we we exist are are successful. Otherwise, the infrastructure that enables us individually to be happy simply isn't there. And the self-illusion gets in the way of that. Do you see the whole world as being solved? And if I guess a uh, question connected to that is, in what ways can we move forward into a, a world where we understand our persons as persons? Yeah, I think that it's really essential that we do that. And I think that it's very difficult. Um, because one way of understanding how pernicious the self-illusion can be is not only in terms of individual psychopathology, um, but in collective psychopathology that plays out in uh, divisive uh, politics, that plays out in the international stage, in the projection of competing identities, in its worst case, um, ends up in wars. Mm -hmm. Um, and, um, when we look at global, global crises, like the climate crisis, for instance, plays out in terms of each person trying to figure out how they can at least profit in the short term, uh, from the climate crisis, rather than asking the question, how can we work together to create a future for all of us? So I actually think that, um, an enormous, um, amount of the suffering in the world uh, individual, collective, political, is constituted by different versions of the self-illusion. And if people ask, you know, the question, why don't people ever learn? Why after the last war is there still another war? Why after the last economic crisis is there another economic crisis? Why after we've learned how to lift people out of poverty, is there still so much poverty and so forth? I think the boring answer to that is that people forget their hypersociality um, and um, try to act in their individual self-interest, taking that to be rational, when in fact it's the most irrational thing that we could possibly do um, as a species or individually. Um, and um, that's all the self-illusion. Mm -hmm. Do you feel you've personally made, uh, you know, do you, do you feel you more so understand yourself as a person, day-to-day -day life? I, I, I like to think that I'm better at it than I once was, but I think that I, like everybody, um, am biologically and psychologically subject to that illusion. And whenever I think I'm not, I just draw the Mueller-Liar illusion for me, for myself, and say, look, I just drew it, and it still looks like one line is longer than the other. And if I sucker for this one, where am I suckering in my psychological life for the self-illusion? And I can always find it. Mm. So I think it's a constant battle for all of us, um, and it's it's not meant to be easy. That's the, that's the difficulty with illusions um, for which we've evolved, mm. that they're really persistent and they are um, resistant to our efforts to dispel them. Mm -hmm. And so it takes work. It takes work. Is there anything you'd like to add about your book that you feel is key that we haven't touched upon? Oh, I don't think so. I just hope that if, if people read it and they find it interesting, um, they take it further. And if they find that it's wrong, they go out there and refute it. Um, because as I say, I don't think that by any means it's the last word in all of this. Of course, I think that it's roughly right or I wouldn't have written it. But um, I'm also prepared to be shown that I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. What are you working on now? Ah, I'm working on a, a bunch of things. One of them is actually going to be a curious companion to this book. Um, and it'll be coming out later this year, co-authored with Maria Heim and Bob Scharf, um, also on Princeton University Press. And it's going to be called How to Lose Yourself. And it's in the Princeton series of Ancient Wisdom for Modern Minds. And what that will be will be a selection of readings from Nagarjuna, Chandrakirti, Tsongkhapa, from the early Pali Buddhist canon, and from the Zen world on selflessness. So it will be kind of the readings to go along with this book. Um, that's one project. 
And I'm also working on a similar project for that same series on Buddhist ethics that will be exploring the applications of selflessness in uh, becoming a better person. So those are two of the things I'm working on. There's other stuff too, like a big book on Chandra Kirti, but those are the ones that I think will be that are definitely aimed at gender old readers. Okay. A sort of trio of how to lose yourself. Yeah, yeah. I figure this is fun stuff to work on. Well, uh, I'll be sure to put the link for Losing Ourselves in the uh, description below, but I feel that's a good place to finish up. So, Jay Garfield, thanks very much. Thanks very much, James. It's been a pleasure.